Good morning, everyone. So good to be here to join you in worship and to deliver the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Our God and Heavenly Father, our triune Lord, we come before you today with much thanksgiving in our hearts. All that we want is to hear from you because we know that our lives should be anchored upon your word. Nowadays, we listen to fake news. We listen to a lot of information. And sometimes we can be derailed at some point in our thinking, especially about end times, about our life together as a church. As we wait for your coming, there will be deception and false prophets who would be coming, and we know that from your word. And so we thank you because today, at this point, we can pause for a moment and ponder upon your sacred, your living word. God, I pray that the Holy Spirit would come and just open our eyes and our hearts today as we commune with you, our God, the Holy Trinity. I pray that you would just minister to us today and use your servant for the glory of your name. This we pray, God, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Today, we will be talking about the church in the end times, and um, the subtitle is Understanding the Relationship Between Ecclesiology and Eschatology. So I'm a theology instructor here in Ebenezer, so we'll be introducing you to theological terms, uh, fancy words, but really they are not that deep. So when we say of ecclesiology, we're talking about the church, the doctrine of the church, and when we say eschatology, we're talking about the doctrine of the end times or the last days. And when I'm studying, I realize that when we talk about the end times, we should also talk about the church because that is the context of the discussion on eschatology, the end times. So today we'll be learning a little bit about the relationship between the two. So let me begin with this statement. Misinformation about the reality of the end times. Uh, all right, one more. Yeah. About the reality of the end times can be mentally depressing and even economically devastating. Who among us here would agree to this statement? Can you just quickly raise your hand? Asaka sa mga nasa online world, you can click like. Well, uh, when we are misinformed about the end times, it can be mentally depressing and it could cause paranoia. We will be uh, paranoid about the end times and not just being mentally paranoid, but it would cost us money as well. Now, who can remember Y2K Millennium Bug? Can you also quickly raise your hand? Yan. Uh, wag kayong mahiya, no? Magkaedad lang tayo. Yan. <laughs> Ayun sa mga hindi nag-raise ng hands, para sa ano yan, Pastor? So, nung wala pang COVID-19, hindi pa sikat yung COVID-19, meron kami noong Y2K, Millennium Bag. So, it started with a um, IT information that there would be a bug, okay? So, in the uh, internet that would uh, shut down all computers. And eventually, that would happen by the year two. So yung iba hindi pa pinanganak siguro at that time. By year 2000, the world would end because there would be a malfunction sa ating computer system because the computer before, they were programmed to read as in 98, as 1998. So what happens when the end would be 00? zero? So there will be a malfunction in the computer and there were a lot of fake news that happened along the way. And so shut down ang ating um, computer, eventually the electricity will fail as well, and then that would be the beginning of the end of the world. And it's a little bit funny, no? medyo nakakatawa ngayon, but before, I was 14 years old at that time, and uh, we were thinking that it would be the end of the world na talaga. Okay? Uh, nandun lang naman kami sa titay, medyo bundok na area, 
malayo sa kabiasnan. And so, what we were hearing during that time is, baka totoo na talaga ito. End of the world na. And so, I heard people, this is true, I heard people selling their businesses and their material possession, real estate, for a very low price. Imagine. Because... Why would you still hoard a lot of material possession when it's the end of the world? Tama ba? Then you learn to dispose them and you spend the money to your family. And so that happened. It caused them economically, you know, a devastation during that time. And so during the eve of December 31, I cannot really forget this, December 31, 1999, we were waiting because that would be January 1, 2000, uh, on the next day. And so on the eve, exactly 12 midnight, blackout. Doon sa lugar lang namin, hindi ko lang po alam dito. But blackout, siguro pinaglaruan din kami ng Samsureko doon. So nag-blackout. And sabi ko, wow, ito na talaga. So this is the beginning of the end times, the new millennium. Takot na takot ako, 14 years old, imagine that. But eventually, bumalik siya. O sabi ko, wow, it's a prank pala, no? fake news. Eventually, it did not happen. So misinformation about the reality of the end times can be mentally depressing. Uh, it could be just like now, because of COVID-19, there's somewhat like a paranoia going all over around the country, or even the whole world, and uh, a lot of people are also spending a lot of money uh, just to prepare for this. But what should be our understanding about the end times? When we talk about the end times, uh, in theology, we actually are talking of two big things, okay? The first one would be the millennial reign. Everybody say with me, millennial reign. Yeah, okay. So we're talking about the millennium, the millennial reign of Christ. And the other thing is the great tribulation. So the millennial reign is in connection with the coming of Christ, the second coming of Christ that we are waiting. And then the great tribulation is in connection with the rapture, or uh, if some people would not use the word rapture, or the act of being caught up, the event of being caught up together with the Lord. So where did we get this uh, understanding of the millennial reign of Christ? We, found, we can find this in Revelation 24. It says here, I saw thrones. This is the vision given to the Apostle John. And he's saying here, I saw thrones on which, we, uh, which were seated those who had been given authority to judge. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony about the Lord and because of the Word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or on their heads. So we're talking about the mark of the beast, the 666. So it's here, and that's the description. And then it says here, they came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Those ones who persevered to the end, even to the point of death, they were resurrected. They came to life. And they reigned with Christ, and we are co-heirs with Christ. By the way, I want you to look at the person beside you. Medyo malayo yan. But say to that person, you are co-heir with Christ. Yeah, and we are all co-heirs. Where we are in Christ, we are co-heirs with Christ. And in the last days, in the end times, we will be resurrected with Christ. And we will reign with Christ for a thousand years. So that's what we are talking about here, the millennial reign of Christ. But in church history or in um, the history of the Christian teachings, there are three interpretations or three views, dominant views about the millennial reign. We know for sure that Christ would come and he would reign for a thousand years, and it's here. It's from the scripture, Revelation 24. But there are three views, uh, dominant views in church history about the interpretation to the millennial reign of Christ. The first one is what we call uh, the post-millennial view or post-millennialism from the word post. And the other one is amillennialism. And the third one is what we call the pre-millennialism. 
Let me break this down, okay? Just very quickly. This is not a theology class, so we will just be giving the general understanding. And later on, uh, I'll try to make sense of what is going on here when we are talking about the millennial reign of Christ. So post-millennialism, this is with reference to the coming of Christ. In other words, uh, post-millennium, after post, Jesus would come back after the millennial reign. Okay? So there would be a thousand years, and after that thousand years, Jesus would come back. Jesus would come again, the second advent, as they would say. Jesus would come uh, after the 1,000 years. In this view, uh, this is a very optimistic kind of view, that all the nations in the world will be evangelized, and there will be unprecedented peace and righteousness. Very optimistic kind of view. And then after that, we will be introduced, ushered in into the millennium, okay, the 1,000 years, whether that is metaphorical or just literal 1,000 years, then after the 1,000 years, Jesus would come again. That's what we call post-millennialism. The second is amillennialism. In this view, uh, we are not anticipating for a future millennium. In other words, the church today, the age of the church, the period of the church, this is now the millennium. Okay? So that's the view of a millennialism, and then the last one is what we call pre millennialism. Pre, in other words, uh, before. In other words, Jesus would come back, and then the millennium would begin. The millennial reign of Christ would begin. In fact, he would come to establish the millennium itself. So that's the uh, view of pre millennialism. So we ask the question, and. I begging to ask the question, so what is the view of Kamakop? What is uh, the view of Alliance? Or uh, to be specific, what is the biblical view or the closest interpretation to the scriptural teaching? Before I would answer that question, let me talk about the second thing, okay? The Great Tribulation in reference to the rapture or the act or the event of being caught up together with the Lord. And so it says here in Mark 13, 19 to 20, this is Jesus saying, for those days will be such a time of tribulation, suffering, testings, trials, as has not occurred since the beginning of the creation which God created until now and never will again. So this kind of tribulation, we call it great tribulation because for all we know, we have been experiencing tribulations already. The minor tribulation, the testing of our faith, the difficulties that we have when we are serving the Lord. We are already uh, experiencing that. But this one is, uh, is not the usual tribulation. That's why we call it great tribulation because it has not occurred yet. And this is something... Uh, that has not happened yet, and it's very devastating uh, in a way. So, in uh, verse 20, it says, And if the Lord does not shorten those days, can you imagine this? No life would have been saved for the sake of the elect or the people of God whom He called, uh, whom He chose, He shortened the days. So we're talking about the Great Tribulation. And again, there are three dominant views on uh, the rapture or the act or the event of being caught up in relation to the great tribulation. The first thing is what we call the post-tribulationist view. Post, again, the word after. In other words, uh, we will be caught up or we will be raptured after going through the great tribulation. In other words, we need all of us in other words, all of us would need to persevere towards the end and because we will all go through the tribulation and God will strengthen us supernaturally as we go through that as a church and towards the end we'll be caught up together with the Lord and then we will be with Him forever. That's the post-tribulationist view. The second one is what we call pre-tribulationist -tri -tri view. In other words, we will be caught up even before the wrath of God would come. Even before the great tribulation would come, we would be caught up 
together with the Lord. In other words, we will not suffer the great tribulation, but we will be spared. We will be caught up. That's the pre-tribulation. So now you're thinking, so ano pala yung na-inherit ko na view? Parang eto na yon. So there's another modification of that view, and we call it the third view. We call it the mid-tribulationist view. What is mid-tribulationism? Is a pattern from Daniel 9 where there is three and a half years of the wrath of man. Okay, because seven day, uh, seven years ang tribulation, whether that's metaphorical or uh, um, literal. So it's seven years or seven days, a period. Three and a half of that would be the wrath of man, and then three and a half would be the wrath of God. So what happens to us in this view? After the wrath of man, we will go through the suffering and testing in, under the wrath of man or the Antichrist. But then in the middle, we will be caught up. There would be a rapture. We will be caught up together with the Lord. And then the wrath of God would come to those unbelievers. So that's what we call the mid-tribulationist view. And again, we go back to the pressing question. So what is the view of the Christian and Missionary Alliance Churches of the Philippines or to be specific, what is the closest to the biblical account? Now, I'm afraid I'm not going to answer that question for you today. But what I will be giving to you is a theological framework, or I would say lens. Okay, we have our lens to view things. A perspective, a theological perspective, and I call it a framework for us to make sense of these uh, complexities when we talk about the end times. Because we have diverse of information, uh, diverse information, and then they have also their supporting verses to this. But if we understand this theological lens, we'll be able to navigate through the complexities of this information. So what is this theological framework? It's taken from Deuteronomy 29.29. It says, The secret things belong to our Lord or to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our sons forever so that we might or we may follow all the words of this law. So in this lens, we are exposed to two things. Number one is the secret things. The second one is the revealed things. So we must admit, dapat paalalahan natin ang ating sarili, that there are really secret things and there are also revealed things. There are things revealed and there are things concealed. Okay? And so, why? why are there things concealed? Number one is because we are finite. We cannot know everything all at once. The second is because we are fallen. We have the tendency to interpret things according to our own perspective, our fallen perspective. And so, there are secret things. And so, what do we do with the secret things and the revealed things? The revealed things, we need to obey. Because it's clearly there. It's stated there. The thing that we need to do is just to obey. We respond to this according to the command of the Lord. Now, how about the concealed things? Now, we need to affirm the revealed things, okay, in clarity. But we need to take caution or we need to be cautious with the things concealed in mystery. Yun yung kailangan natin go in. In other words, it doesn't mean also that we cannot talk about the secret things or the things concealed in mystery. It's just that when we make a statement about the secret things, we should not make it as if, as if it's conclusive na ito na lang talaga. Na in, ang term nila is maging dogmatic tayo na wala nang ibang view, ito lang talaga. We can talk about it, but we can present an understanding that these are just a way of making sense of the mystery that we have from the Scripture. Because we must admit that we cannot know everything. Tingnan mo yung katabi mo, sabihin mo, alam mo ba lahat? Yan, ang sagot dyan, sana all. No, alam ang lahat. Pero sana all, alam lahat talaga ni Lord. Tayo, hindi. No, kasi nga, limitado tayo. We are finite and we are fallen 
as well. And what's amazing is this. When we go to 1 Thessalonians 4 to 5, we can see this lens used by Apostle Paul himself when he talked about the end times. Kaya gusto kong sabihin ito, it's not just with the end times that we can apply this principle, but with theology itself in general. But now in particular, we'll be talking about the end times or eschatology. So let's open our scripture to 1 Thessalonians 4. We'll begin there, 4 uh, from verse 13. And eventually later we'll go to uh, chapter 5 of the same book, 1 Thessalonians. This is Apostle Paul, okay? The things revealed. Verse 13, but we do not want you to be uninformed. Very clear. Brothers and sisters about those who are asleep so that you will not grieve as indeed the rest of the mankind do who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose from the dead and we say amen to this, so also God will bring him those who have fallen asleep through Jesus. That's very clear. In other words, in effect, what Apostle Paul is saying here is that, you know, you need to be informed. Because we are dead sure about these things. We are very sure about these things. And you need to inform yourself. Otherwise, if you will not be informed, you will be uninformed. You will be like the unbelievers in the world. Na walang hope. We go through testings and trials. We go through COVID-19. Wala tayong hope. Madali lang talagang mawala ng pag-asa pag wala tayo dyan kay Kristo. Sa ngayon na uh, mga panahon. And we are on the last days, by the way. And so it's here, you need to be informed what are those things. And we have three things here in First Thessalonians 4. It says in verse 15, For we say this to you, by the word of the Lord. In other words, this is not just Apostle Paul saying things. Na, you know, his own interpretation of things. This is coming anchored from the word of the Lord. That we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. Ang ibig sabihin ng fallen asleep is a euphemism of those people who died already ahead of us. And then he says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then, who, then we who are alive, who remain, will be caught up together with them in the cloud to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. In verse 18 it says, Therefore comfort one another with these words. Three things here that we are dead sure, that we are really, really sure. Revealed things. The first one is the Lord Himself will descend from heaven. This is the descent of Christ. The second coming. And it is bodily. This is not in spirit that He will descend. This is in flesh. Of course, the resurrected body that Jesus would come down. That we can see Him visibly. It's revealed here. In other words, when people around the, the world, and especially in Dabao, no, in Mount Tamayong, would claim that I am the new Christ, then we need to ask the question, nakita ba natin siya na bumaba sa langit, papunta dito sa lupa? Because it's here. Jesus would come back, and, and so we ask the question, paano saan nakuha ni Paul to? Is, of course, we know that it's supernaturally revealed to him, is the apostle of the last days. But can we infer, can we go back from the scripture and say, okay, did uh, Jesus, you know, reveal this? Or were there accounts in the scripture that we can say that Jesus would really come, come back in, in a bodily manner? May meron siyang katawan, not just, you know, palutang-lutang na spirit. We go back to Acts 1.11. When Jesus ascended into heaven, the disciples were just waiting for him there. And they were looking up to the heavens. And you know what happened? The angels appeared and said, Anong ginagawa niyo mga disciples? The same Jesus, okay, who ascended, would also descend in your presence. So he's there. He's there. He's, he's, Apostle Paul was not just making this up. This is not just his own interpretation. It's really from the testimony of the apostles themselves. The eyewitnesses 
of Jesus and His life, resurrection, and His death. And then He says here, that's the first thing, the descent of Jesus, the second coming. Another thing that is, you know, be, that we are really sure of is the dead in Christ will rise. There will be resurrection in the last days. The believers would be resurrected and we will be ushered into God's kingdom. The unbelievers would also be resurrected and they would receive judgment. That is what is revealed for us. There will be resurrection. And so we ask the question, Saan ito makikita? Is this just an interpretation of Paul? Remember Jesus? John 11:25, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, although he dies, he will live. That God, Jesus, would resurrect us. And this mindset is really a prevailing mindset of Apostle Paul when he underwent difficulties and trials. Not maybe the great tribulation, but the the mini tribulation, mini yon, but he was shipwrecked, no, uh, he was flogged, and all of the sufferings that he faced during that time. Because he was looking forward that even if these people would kill me, there will be a resurrection in the last days. When you read the letters of Apostle Paul to the churches, it's a prevailing mindset whenever we encounter difficulties. And that should be our understanding as well that there would be resurrection. We do not need to fear what will happen. In, in fact, in verse 18, it says, therefore, comfort one another. In other translation, it says, encourage one another. Sometimes when we talk about the end times, people, you know, would get so scared and fearful because the details are, you know, a little bit scary at some point. We cannot deny that. But that's not the goal. It should not confuse us. It should not scare us as well. It should bring edification and encouragement to us, as stated in verse 18, comfort one another with this word. So we have the resurrection, we have the second coming, and then we have the being caught up together. And some theologians would not use the word rapture to describe this because when, they, when you use the word rapture, it's like a secret event. You know, uh, and, and they would say it's not really a secret event. So let's just avoid the word rapture, although we know that. Let's just use the word from the scripture. It says, we will be caught up together with the Lord. I don't know if you can still deny that because it's really from the scripture that we will be caught up together with the Lord. And so we will always be with the Lord. And so we ask the question, saan kaya galing ito? This is revealed to Paul supernaturally, but there was one experience of Paul, in fact, his testimony to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 12. When he said, this is his testimony, but he was talking in third person that there was a man who was caught up in the third heaven and this man was given supernatural revelation from the Lord. And then in another phrase, in, in 2 Corinthians 12, he described this cutting up as being caught up in paradise. So when Paul would mention this word again, being caught up, we cannot but go back to that reference that, you know, even he himself, he was not able to discern, was that in a bodily form or, you know, or something that happened to him as a vision? He could not fully grasp it with his limited mind. But we know that this is a reality. This is a spiritual reality. We cannot deny this because it's from the Scripture. And so Paul was saying there would be a time that we will be caught up together with the Lord. And so the conclusion is this. We do not need to fear. In fact, he said, comfort one another with this word. In, in, yeah. He says there, yeah. So that, that's the end of the things revealed. Now let's go to the things concealed. In mystery, in chapter 5, verse 1, he says, Now as to the period of times, Brothers and sisters, you have no need of anything to be written to you. In other words, alam na alam niyo to. I, I should not, you know, write something about this because you know this very well. 
the periods and the time. For you yourself know fully well or full well that the day of the Lord is coming just like a thief in the night. While they are saying peace and safety, then sudden destruction will come upon them like labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness, so that the day would overtake you like a thief. We do not belong there. We are prepared and we are ready. As to the periods and times, the answer is we do not know. We are sure about the resurrection, the second coming, and then we will be caught up together with the Lord. We are dead sure about that. But if we ask the question, when? The answer is we do not know. It's so fascinating that, you know, humanity would really want to know the exact date of the end times. Remember the Mayans, the ancient civilization, when they uh, forecasted or predicted that the world would end by 2012, that 10, 10 years ago, 10, 2012, yeah, that's the exact year for them in their calendar, that the world would end by 2012. And three years before that, there was a movie released, okay, um, um, in Hollywood, I think, a Hollywood movie, and the title is 2012. Can you still remember that? Have you watched that movie? Okay, it earned uh, around $700 billion box office three years before the prediction of the Mayan people. But lo and behold, it did not happen. And so they need to recalibrate the calendar and, you know, say, what did we miss? Bakit hindi nangyari? And then uh, there's an information going on in the internet that Nostradamus also predicted that this year there will be a comet, a huge comet that would hit the earth and it would cause devastation and that would be the beginning of the, ends of, the end of the world. And so um, I don't know if you have watched the movie don't, Do Not Look Up or Don't Look Up. It's patterned according to that predi prediction as well, or forecast. You see, um, it's so fascinating that humanity would really want to know the exact date. But the point is we really do not know. In fact, Apostle Paul was not the first one who said that, you know, we, we really do not know. And he's not just saying, I do not know, but he's saying to his own people during his time that I do not need to remind you of this, but the truth is we really do not know. In fact, it was Jesus who said that the Son, even the Son, does not know. Now, in theology, we're not saying that Jesus cannot know, but he just choose not to know. The, cha the Son of God, Jesus himself, chose not to, not, not to know the date of His coming at that point when He was asked by the disciples. Because they were also curious, just like us. In Matthew 24, they went to Jesus and asked Jesus, so when will this, when will this uh, end of time would come? And you know what? Jesus answered them. Anong sagot ni Jesus? He answered them with three parables. Can you imagine that? You ask one question and then you will be given three parables. <laughs> the parables of the ten virgins, the parable of the bags of gold in Matthew 24, and the parable of the sheep and the goats. Matthew 24 onwards. In effect, what Jesus was saying and teaching to his disciples, yes, you do not know and you cannot know the exact time but parable of the ten virgins, but you need to be prepared, just like the ten virgins. And then the parable of the bags of gold. Yes, you cannot know and you will not know the exact time, but remember, you are accountable. That's the parable of the bags of gold. Okay? And then the parable of the sheep and the goats. Yes, you will not know the exact date and time, but remember, you will be judged. That in the end times, there will be a separation of the sheep and the goat. We cannot really know, but we can prepare for this. 
And so what is the application? So what? Now what? Again, it's repeated by Apostle Paul in verse 11. He says, therefore, encourage one another, comfort one another. It's the same word. And build one another up. Wow, amazing. So this is now the relationship of eschatology to ecclesiology, to the church and our uh, life today. Just as you are doing as of this moment, but we ask you, brothers and sisters, to recognize those who diligently labor among you and are in leadership over you in the Lord and give instruction. Now, when was the last time that you encouraged and appreciate those who labor among you? Like Pastor Ramsel, our uh, admin pastor here, the people who are working, our under-shepherd working for the flock the pastors who are here, the, the leaders of the church, the volunteers of the church. Instead of being overly fascinated with the end times and the details, you know, and all the reports, we connect everything, and all the mga uh, fake news, mga tourists all over the internet of the end times. <laughs> Look at this. It's the, the now. Yes, we anticipate Jesus coming, but we need to focus on what we are doing at this point. And he, Apostle Paul reminded them, you know what? What you need to do is to encourage those who diligently labor. Basi pagod na rin yan sila. Encourage one another, those who are in authority, leading you as a people of God. And sabi niya, live in peace with one another. Huwag nang mag-away-away pa. Diba? Parating na si Jesus. Eh, nandyan pa. No, we uh, ha- have conflicts with one another, misunderstanding with one another. We urge you, brothers and sisters, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with everyone. Amazing. Very realistic. So that's why I said, whenever we talk about eschatology without the proper context, and that is the church and the ministry, I don't think that would be a fruitful discussion, theological discussion, because it should be within the context of what we are doing today in the church. And then in verse 15, it says, See that no one repays another with evil for evil, but always seek what is good for one another and for the people. And again, our famous verse, Rejoice always. Can you say amen to this? Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks. Oy, binigay pala yan within the context of, you know, the second coming. Hindi natin alam for a while, no? We have been quoting this verse and it's within the context of eschatology, the second coming of Christ, the end times. And then sabi niya, do not quench the spirit, do not utterly reject the prophecies, but examine everything, hold firmly to that, to that which is good, abstain every form of evil. So in summary, this is the statement. Now, this is like a blessing, you know, a declaration, a benediction to the people of God in Thessalonians, but this is like a summary of what Apostle Paul is trying to say to the believers in uh, Thessalonica. It says, Now may the God of peace himself, the word is sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be kept complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he who calls you, and he also will do it. When you study this passage, chapter 4 and chapter 5. Chapter 3 was also a talk on sanctification. Even before he talked about, you know, the end times, he talked about the sanctification of the church, and now he's ending this with a summary, talking about being sanctified entirely, you know, being sanctified rather entirely as a church, individually and corporately as a church. In other words, it's sandwich. Na sandwich yung talk on eschatology doon sa talk on sanctification, living a holy life for God. Now, the, this is the point for us this morning. Uh, I think we need, we need to read this together. 
Can we do that today? Okay, ready, go. Knowing both the certainty of Christ's coming and the uncertainty of its timing, let us edify one another by living a sanctified life. That's the point. We need to edify, encourage one another. And what Apostle Paul is driving here, the point is we live a sanctified life. Some people, they are over, you know, overly fascinated with the second coming, with all the details, and then they connect all the prophecies. Uh, I have no problem with that. We need to study the Word of God and we need to study prophecies. But sometimes we come to a point of, you know, arguing with others because they have a different view. And then we also present our view and we refer to the scripture. We must admit that there are things concealed and we cannot really, you know, be definite and be conclusive about these things. But we need to know that there are uncertainties, especially the timing. But we are encouraged to edify one another by living a sanctified life. In other words, as we anticipate for the coming of Christ, we need to live our life here and now anticipating for the coming. Whatever you are doing at this point, you persevere. If you are doing Bible study, there will come a point that you will, you know, you need to pause for a while at you know, because may mga restrictions, everything. We need to follow the protocols of the government. But you just pause. You don't quit. Tap lang muna, sandali. But we do not quit. We continue. We persevere with the ministry of, you know, living a holy life so that we can impact the world. We need to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world because that's our calling. I'll end with this quotation, and this is very meaningful to me from Augustine of Hippo, a church father. And he says this, he says, He who loves the coming of the Lord is not he who affirms it is far off, nor it is he who says it is near. It is he, whether he it is far or near, awaits with sincere faith, steadfast hope, and fervent love. And for me, he's talking about a sanctified life. Sincere faith, steadfast hope, and fervent love. My prayer is just like the prayer of Apostle Paul to the people of Thessalonians for our church, for this church, that we will be found, found faithful in our walk with the Lord, in living a sanctified life when Jesus would come back again. Can we just bow our heads in prayer? Let's commit this time to the Lord. Our God, Heavenly Father, we thank you because you have chosen to reveal yourself and to, to reveal your plans as well. Although we must admit as well that there are still things concealed, but for those things that you have revealed clearly, we are deemed to obey them. We must submit and obey those words from you. God, we thank you because today we have been blessed by the instruction of your word. I pray that you will continue to guide us. Let the Holy Spirit live in us and allow us, Lord, to live a sanctified life because we cannot do this on our own. We receive you as Lord and Savior. It's not by our own effort. It's really by the work of your Spirit. And now we are trying to live, live out this life, the kind of life, the cruciform life, not by our own might, but by your own power as well. So I pray, God, that as we anticipate for your coming to restore everything back and to uh, make the fulfillment of your prophecies and your words, I pray, God, that you will continue to strengthen us, to guide us, to empower us, that we will not grow weary, that we will persevere because you who is faithful will continue to supply the strength that we need and everything that we need for life and godliness. We give you praise and glory in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen.